insecure, avoidant, anxious, and disorganized. Those are four attachment styles. And yes, you can meander in and out of the bottom three, but once you hit the secure attachment, usually that's where you know that you're really starting to make progress. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Welcome to episode 77 of the Positivity Experience, Understanding Attachment Styles. Check it out. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to episode 77 of the Positivity Experience. It's your girl, Lori. And before we jump into this week's episode, I want to give a huge shout out to the newest Patreon members coming in at our gratitude level. We have Winkel Vickery. Hopefully I did not mess that up too, too much. And over in our abundance, which also gives you access to the Facebook group and a few other goodies like giveaways and things like that at some point once you've been on there for three months. And a huge shout out to Karen Sloan, who is now my new cricket friend, who's going to teach me how to use my cricket. Krista Harpin, I hope I said that correctly, Tracy Rinscher, and Ellen Crawford. So a huge welcome. Um, a lot of good feedback on last week's Patreon episode uh, with the procrastination. So huge shout out to you guys. And if you're wondering what Patreon is, it's the paid version um, that kind of uh, acts as a little bit of like a toolbox in conjunction to this podcast. So this podcast is always going to be free. I'm not changing it. So you guys don't have to worry about it. And if you choose to do that, it just gives you a little bit more insight and um, some direction and tools on where to get started. So with that being said, I'm going to jump into today's topic. It has been highly requested over all of my socials. And I was like, you know what? Okay, I'm going to get on here and I'm going to do this. And I'm actually recording this in the early part of the week. So I have some travel coming up. So I'm trying to get a few of these in the hopper. So if for some reason you decide to join the Patreon or there's other things in next week ep- next week's episode, if you don't hear your name, it's not that I'm avoiding you. It's that I have recorded this so you could have the podcast while I am not around in the area. So I want to talk to you about attachment because I know that you've heard people say, you know, this is my attachment style. And, you know, what is an attachment style? And, you know, how can I change my attachment style? I think we should do a drinking game. And every time I say attachment or attachment style, you should take a shot. You'll be really drunk in 30 minutes. And, you know, so here's the concept of attachment styles. And there is a real, this is a real thing. But as with everything else I talked to you about, you don't get to use this as an excuse. So I want to put that out there. Whether no matter what you're going through, you can't go into a victim mentality Okay, I have a whole podcast if you want it um, coming up that's going to be on the victim mentality and, uh, you know, what that looks like. Because when you live as a victim to your circumstances, right? And listen, nobody said it's a cakewalk. Life itself is not a cakewalk, right? And yeah, your trauma is extremely real to you. But if you live in the trauma space, you will never find the solution. And it can become a big excuse as to why you're not changing because you want to identify as somebody else, but you've only known the trauma. So that also goes into these attachment styles. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because just because you have an attachment style, you don't get to say, well, this is, I'm just an avoidant attacher, attachment, oh well, like that's not okay. It, this is all about identifying. Now, over on Patreon this week in the episode, I'm going to give you um, kind of like a, a an exercise that you can do to help kind of work through this. But I want you to understand what the attachment styles are and to be very clear in understanding, you can go in and out of several of these. Well, there's only four, <laughs> but you can go in and out of, of each one. But I will tell you in the secure attachment, once you get there, I'm not saying that it's like a permanent thing, but kind of because that's where I live now in the secure attachment. But I meandered through all of those other ones multiple times, sometimes like three all at one time, (laughs) never a secure attachment. I was like, that's not even a thing until I got here. So in general, your attachment styles are going to happen between about seven to 11 months old. There's been a lot of research in it, seven months to 11 months old. Okay. And the attachment styles come from the infancy and the caregivers. Because think about this. When you're born, you can't just eat. You can't just walk to the refrigerator. You can't just go to the bathroom. I mean, you do just go to the bathroom, but you can't go to the physical bathroom. So you are uh, in some ways attached uh, to your caregivers, right? Because the this is where your codependency, well, 
obviously you're going to be codependent at that age. But this is where the attachment can go into codependency and all of those things go hand in hand. So when we're born, you got to have some kind of level of that. Now, some of these comes from not having a bond, uh, various amounts of other things. So you'll see how that codependency can play into it because codependency, codependency falls in one of these. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get to that attachment style. So set, there's like four. So, But now don't get that twisted that after seven to 11 months, oh, well, that's it. Whatever happened then, that's your attachment style. Because that's not true. Okay, that's not a true statement. Yes, it is true because that's where it's going to start. But throughout the rest of your life and the situations and choices in which you make can actually contribute to that. That being said, seven to 11 months old with that being shown, you know, and it's hard to really think about that, right? So like, um, I have kids. I know a lot of you have kids. Let's say some of you haven't had kids yet. It's going to be really hard in that infancy of seven to 11 months to think, wow, I'm really making a big impact. You are, in general, you're making a big impact. You're showing them what's right, what's wrong at that time for them, how not to get hurt. Um, but you, I think, myself included, I think we all sort of forget the level of impact because how can you when you're dealing with an infant? You just know to take care of them, feed them because, you know, they're not super fun at that age. It's feed them, clothe, you know, clothe them, bathe them, make sure they're healthy. Like, it's just like a work thing, right? So yeah, you can bond and you can have a great time. But on the other side of that, sometimes people aren't capable of doing that. And that's where these attachment theories come into play, because that's what it is. It's a theory, right? And think about when people didn't respond to your cues at seven to 11 months old. Now, this does not mean, listen, I'm fine with the, cry me personally, I'm fine with the whole cry it out thing. Um, there comes a point in time where you're going to hear these as all being like people being neglected and various things like that. But there's also the caveat of the other side of that. So just you can't keep doting on somebody. You can't put them on some pedestal like they're like imperfect and you'll give them anything they want. That creates an attachment style too. Okay. So don't think that this is just for people who are neglectful. It can be the abundance of like really making somebody the golden child, which I mean, I dare to say in every family there is one. It's just the level in which you've taken taken it, right? And But it is how we kind of uh, work through our relationships. And where it can become hard is like, let's say if you have like an anxious attachment and somebody else has an avoidant attachment and then you go, this isn't working. You damn straight, it's not working. Stop trying to put a round peg in a square hole. If you don't know the other person's attachment style and then you get irritated with the person, that's not their fault. This is where you have to take the L. Stop trying to, just because you want someone in your life, this is a little separate topic, but it goes into this. Just because you want someone in your life, a friend, a spouse or whatever, does not mean that they are the healthiest for you. I don't care if you want them. You have to keep in mind and you'll kind of see how this works because you kind of want to check your, your attachment style and then you want to kind of check somebody else's attachment style, but you don't get to choose for them to get out of their attachment style. And again, you can go in and, you know, in and out and meander through a few of these. So it's not like just because if you have insecure attachments today doesn't mean you're not going to have an avoidant attachment tomorrow. So this is why you can't be a victim to the, to the circumstances. This is the exact reason why. Because if you tell yourself, this is just how I am, or this is my problem, that's where you'll live and you won't desire to come out of it. So let's talk a little bit about the various levels of, of attachment and what, you know, what you can do about it. So I want you to know that which, with your attachment styles, it typically will mirror the dynamics with your caregiver in your childhood. Right. So if somebody was dismissive of you, there's a good chance you'll either be dismissive or you'll swing in the complete other direction and be complete people pleasy or a combination of both. So ideally, you want to go for the secure attachment, which is where I finally am. Right. Didn't know it was possible, thought it was a myth, but here we are. And a secure attachment provides secure and loving relationships. Right. You're not afraid of intimacy. And you don't stress when your partner needs a break. You're not codependent. And it's, a, it's amazing, right? Because you don't have any of that resentment. You don't have any of those things. It's what they call foundational attachment, right? So there's been a lot of research on that. And if you go, oh my God, that sounds great. Well, yeah, but I would dare to say, now, and listen, there are people who are born with this attachment style. Yes, they are actually born that way. Like, I mean, not born that way. They are created that way by their caregivers, right? But if if I'd be honest with you, I think a lot of people land on the secure attachment by doing the work, 
remember, if you're not doing the work, you're not going to heal. Like you can't just say, I want to feel better. And then the magic fairy comes down and goes, poof, you feel better now. Like it's not the fairly odd parents. That's not what we're doing here. So you're going to have to do that. So but just really think of that. And that kind of goes into the relationship I have with Paul, um, with my friends, you know, and because I'm pretty solid in my in my convictions and I understand how other people are too. So I don't I don't stress them with it. I'm fine if my if Paul doesn't call me. Well, first of all, we don't check on each other all throughout the day. I would think something was seriously wrong with him if he did. But if he did, you know, and he started getting kind of clingy and needy, I would have to kind of address that pretty quickly because as a secure attached person, that would be a little bit of a red flag to me. Okay, now that being said, if you're an avoidant person, it's going to be hard to get in that relationship. But if you have a secure partner, it becomes easier for you to do the work. However, I always recommend trying to do the work as best as you can without being in a relationship, right? Because that's going to be the, the, the main thing. So outside of the secure attachment, which is that, you're going to have three different insecure attachments, okay? So you're going to have your anxious attachment, you're going to have your avoidant attachment, and you're going to have your disorganized attachment. So I want to go through each one of these, okay? Now you can kind of listen to this, and uh, if you want to have a little paper and pad, you can. You don't need to. You can just go, oh, that's me. Do not be alarmed if you're like, holy hell, I'm all three of these things perfectly fine. I just told you you can go in and out of them. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So with anxious attachment, okay, this is where you have that deep fear of abandonment. I mean, you are massively fearful of abandonment, okay? You're worrying that people will leave you. You need that validation. You're needy. You're clingy. If somebody doesn't text back, all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, they don't care about me, right? Just know that's anxious. Well, anxious, it says it in the title, right? That's an anxious attachment. So that's the, the fear of abandonment that I hear a lot of. Or, you know, I don't understand. Like I sent a message. Why didn't they respond? Okay, calm down. It's not all about you, right? And ego plays a part of this. While these are your attachment styles, it triggers and kicks up your ego, right? So, and we'll go through each one of these more, but I'm just giving you the overview right now. So that's your anxious attachment. Now, then you have the avoidance. That's the fear of intimacy, right? Up. Uh, kind of hard to commit. Like you're kind of like, eh, yeah, mm, I don't know. So the relationships feel suffocating. They feel, you feel emotionally unavailable. And that's the biggest thing right there, right? So imagine, okay, imagine an anxious attachment person getting involved with an avoidant attachment person. And then you go, why am I not fulfilled in this relationship? Okay, number one, stop trying to con con control them and change them. Right, so I'm gonna give you like this example. Let's say you have an anxious attachment style, afraid of abandonment, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I don't want people to leave me, you're doing all of that. Now, your boyfriend, girlfriend, or your partner is an avoidant attacher, right? So there's a, it, like, you know, they're charming, they're charismatic, but there's a little bit of a standoffish. You know how you're like, God, they feel a little like distant and they kind of wanna commit, but they're not sure if they wanna commit. And they might feel like, oh my God, I need a break. Which by the way, everybody needs their own autonomy and space. Or you may say, oh my God, they're emotionally unavailable. What you don't do is try to stay in a relationship like that because you're not going to get what your needs are. Now, if you choose to stay in it because you're afraid to lose people, you better book a session with me like five minutes ago, like last week. Because we need to get through your attachment style because and, and well, okay, I, I was going to go through the other one, but let's just go on this topic. Because when you have an anxious attachment style, very often people are going to have a hard time being in a committed relationship with you because you're needy and you're clingy. So if someone is needy and clingy, and I would dare to say there's a few people who know me personally on here, um, like personally who come to the house and stuff, and they'll tell you if I was dealing with somebody with an anxious attachment style, which by the way, I've had, remember, I just told you I went through all three of these multiple times, not even in like all three at once. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess you can't, but it was very close to that. So I know that clinginess and that neediness, it becomes suffocating for the other person. And it's not the other, just because you have an anxious attachment style doesn't mean that everybody in the world now has to bow down to you because they have to make you feel better because you have an anxious attachment style. Absolutely do not have to. And this is that, that part of accepting that, right? So let's talk about the fearful, avoidant, or disorganized one, okay? So when you are sitting in a fearful 
and disorganized, that's where you have like uh, a lack of trust, uh, poor boundaries. Now you can have a primary attachment and a sub attachment, like I was saying to you. So really think about that. When you have a disorganized and fearful, uh, fearful attachment, it's, it's this, you just don't trust anybody. You barely even trust yourself. Okay, and boundaries are a non-existent thing because you're so disorganized and discombobulated. And I found that when I had anxious attachment, I had fearful attachment too, which is disorganized attachment. It's almost like both of those ran hand in hand because here's some, a couple traits for you to be aware of. So like when the, in anxious attachment style, there's inconsistency. So if you're not consistent with your practice, you hear me beat this in your head all the time. If you're not consistent, inconsistent actions gets inconsistent um, results. I've told you this. So if you're anxious, you're inconsistent, unpredictable, because there's unpredictability there. Sometimes overly involved, okay, where you are like overly evolved. You're like, you're inserting yourself in everybody's life. You're going to have a savior complex. You're going to come in, you're going to save the day. And that's typically displayed in that seven to 11 month old by like unpredictable parents. So like, one minute they might be there and then the next minute they might not. You know, I don't know because I don't remember being seven months to 11 months. So I have no idea. But I'm just thinking like, and this is me just spitballing. I'm thinking if you're laying there and you're hungry. Now, it's not the other person's fault. They can't read your mind. And you're like, oh, my God, where am I going to get my food from? Like, I don't know. I mean, I don't remember that age. But I would assume it's something where you're like, I have no idea like how consistent my parents are. So if you're an avoidant. Okay, you're not responsive and dismissive. Now, when I say not responsive, I don't mean somebody texts you and you don't text back. Not responsive is like you go, wow, um, how are you today? And you just kind of like ignore them. You're just like, mm, I'm good. Like you're super dismissive, not really responsible, emotionally disconnected. You know, and people go, oh, my God, that sounds like you're talking about a narcissist. Mm, kind of, kind of. I mean, there, there's definitely levels of attachment issues there. Because remember, humans are born codependent, right? So we need that attachment in the beginning. So then what you have to do is you have to learn the detachment as you become an adult because the attachment that you have, you're codependent on these parents or the, your caregivers, whoever those are in, the, in, that, in that early childhood, that you have to do things the way they see it fit, their their false belief systems or their limited belief systems. You're going to have to do that because uh, you're codependent. You have nobody to take care of you but these people. So you don't get to pick that, but it is what it is. And this is where knowing what your attachment style is is great because now you have a space to work on it. But if you don't want to work on it and you think everybody else needs to change, that's going to be problematic. Right. So let's go through these a little bit more so I can tell you about because if you're checking your relationship and you think, my God, I really like this person and we have good times and there's a glimmer of a relationship. And then all of a sudden they just like they they retreat like a turtle. OK, probably, possibly without knowing them. I don't want to like diagnose. They probably have an avoid an attachment. Now, if you're walking around in an anxious attachment, which is a standard, it really, it's to me, I see it a lot more in my practice. So I'm going to tell you it's more common, but just because I see that in my practice. So I, that's what I have to compare it to. But if you really think about it, think about somebody who's clingy, right? And it could be you. Don't, don't beat yourself up about it. This is how we're identifying it. So think about, you know, you're like, oh my God, are you okay? Do you love me? Do you love me? Oh, you didn't text me. You know, I messaged you like 20 minutes ago. Oh, well, are you okay? Like, did I do something wrong? That's all anxious attachment. And it's nobody else's responsibility to heal, heal that but you. It doesn't matter where it came from because we know you got to know where the root is, right? So let's say you say, okay, this is an early childhood attachment because I feel my dad left when I was younger or whatever the case may be. Um, and I am afraid of abandonment. So afraid of abandonment will fall into this anxious category. And again, what you want to do is you, hopefully you find someone who has a secure attachment style. The only issue with that is somebody, because I'm now in that secure attachment style that took me like so long to get here and I want to maintain it because it feels fabulous. It really does, but you have to maintain it. You don't just get here and it's like, ah, you're done. Um, no, you got to practice your wellness every day, which is what I tell you guys about the five journals, about doing their meditations, about getting active, about doing your, your structure and your plans. 
Yeah, it is daily. If you're not committed to doing it daily, you're going to remain in an anxious attachment or any of the attachments. So unless you're willing to see and, and respect the fact that just because you have an anxious attachment style, that people are supposed to bend over backwards for you to make you feel better. Absolutely not. This is your attachment style to process, which is why I always say, um, and it's very helpful, like when my clients come to me who have anxious attachment styles, and we work through it, and let's say they either get out of the relationship, or they've started this relationship, and the partner goes, oh my God, you're doing so much better. I feel so, and they're like, oh my God, this is all I needed to do? Like, holy cow. It's, look, I'm not going to make it sound easy, because it isn't. And I'm not going to make it sound fast, because it most certainly is not. It's not joyful. It's not all of those things until it is. But you got to go through the hell before you can fly. And again, if you're in a relationship and you expect someone to bow down to you because your love language is personal touch and you have an anxious attachment style and they're an avoidant and theirs is words of affirmation, that you guys might not be a good fit. And that's the acceptance category. Because so many people want to change people, but you only change people when they're in diapers. You do not change people any other time, nor should you. Right? So you're like, okay, great. So now I have, you know, there's the, the four, the four. Secure, that's the one you're striving for. Avoidant, anxious, and then of course you have the disorganized and fear, right? The fearful one. So again, I want to go back through those briefly and then I'm going to give you some tools and cues on how you can start working on it. And then over on Patreon, I'm going to take it even up another notch, okay? And I'll give you another exercise there. So again, you're striving for secure attachment. That's when you're being in a relationship and like my husband, Paul, you know, he goes golfing sometimes six days a week. Okay, I'm not stressing. Go, go do you. I hop on a plane by myself. I'm going to go do me. Like I'm good. I'm secure in my relationship. Um, I'm not afraid of intimacy, right? And intimacy isn't just sex. Intimacy is, you know, intimacy. I'm not afraid of that. I definitely don't stress when he needs a break because I'm taking a break. I'm definitely not codependent. But it's taken me a long time to actually go through each one of these other attachment styles in the insecure phase to really help me solidify this. So you so know that where you are doesn't have to be where you remain. Okay, so that's important because when you're in it, and uh, let me tell you, I had an anxious attachment style on the highest of levels. You know, I was avoidant briefly, but I went from avoidant to anxious and disorganized. So I, I would dare to say those two were kind of always present for many, many years until I was able to work through them. And like I said, it's doing the work. But the anxious attachment, fear of abandonment, worrying that people won't like, like you and that they will leave you, the need of validation, feeling needy and clingy. Um, and like I said, I use that example that if somebody doesn't message you or somebody doesn't call you or they don't invite you somewhere, that all of a sudden that they don't love you. Okay, and avoidant, fear of intimacy. Again, not sex, fear of intimacy. Okay, hard to commit. They're kind of in, they're kind of not. The relationships to, the, to them feel suffocating. They're emotionally unavailable. Okay, and then in the disorganized or fearful, you have, like I said, where people in general, you go, huh, whoa, I don't trust anybody. I don't even trust myself. Boundaries, what are boundaries? I don't have boundaries. What am I supposed to do with these boundaries? People speak of boundaries. But then sometimes, like I said, if you were like me and you have that anxious, you want the boundaries though you don't know what they are, but then you're going to people please because you fall in this, this anxious attachment. Okay, and that's the whole concept of attachment theory. You know, and think about this too. There's a desire to be loved by others. This is in the um, fear and uh, uh, disorganized. Okay, there's a desire to be loved by others but there's a struggle for romantic relationships, right? It sounds crazy. And one of the big things with that one specifically, there's, it can actually come with a risk of violence in relationships and even like sexual behaviors, like where you're just constantly running up through people. And that's going to go into that fearful and disorganized, right? And again, they can play, unfortunately, very nicely. Now, there's a couple common traits that you see in that and that I see in that is self-esteem. You have very low self-esteem when you're meandering through those lower levels. When I say lower levels, because we go by, by vibration. So think of secure attachment as like a higher vibration. And the other three is a lower vibration. Not good, not bad, just different vibrations. Vibrations don't carry good and bad. They just are. So now you go, great. 
now that I have these lovely attachment styles, what am I supposed to do with it? Well, again, you're not just going to cl click your heels and all of a sudden you're out of odds. Okay, it's not going to happen that way. And what you have to do is you're going to have to see things from a space of neutral, neutrality, neutral, neutrality, neutrality. We'll go with that. Um, you have to be in a neutral space. Okay. And sometimes that's hard. But you are operating, especially in those other attachment styles, not so much secure, you're operating from a place of emotion. So if you have a fear of abandonment, and I'm asking you to be in a neutral headspace, it's going to be a challenge for you, which is why you need your journals. Okay, go listen to the podcast on, or the YouTube on journals. I have a 10 minute podcast on the five journals. Go right on out there and you can find it. It's free. And it'll help you understand what goes into what journals. So realistically, if you are trying to feel better, but you're trying to be in control and not vulnerable, you're going to have a really difficult time healing it, which is why you don't do it by yourself. At no point should you just think, huh, heard this podcast. Great. I'm going to go do these things and I won't be attached anymore. This will be great. That's not going to happen. And it's not, you know, that's the whole thing. You can't just do this on your own. It's not in the beginning. Because that's why people, that's why people like me who are coaches do this and therapists and that, that's why we're all here. And therapists need therapists, coaches need coaches. Trust me on that. Because I wouldn't have ended up here doing what I'm doing if I didn't go through it with other people to help me. Because I was, I was out of like, I, I felt like I was drowning. I couldn't do it on my own anymore. I tried and it didn't work. So if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, that's the literal definition of insanity. So you got to be really careful of that. So it's the self-esteem. So guess how you work on self-esteem? You do the things that you're afraid of and that you're afraid to fail in. At no point do you get self-confidence and self-esteem and then go do the things. See, that would be the safe bet. That would be trying to be in the comfort zone. That's not going to work. You got to push yourself out of the comfort zone. You got to allow yourself to do the things. That's what builds self-esteem. Here's the other side of that. Now, this is going to get a little like hardcore, hardcore. You ready? If something or someone does not serve you, you have to distance from them. Yep. I don't care if it's a parent. I don't care if it's a child. If you're not willing to do that, then you're going to stay in the same space. And again, when you're dealing with these attachment styles and insecurities, it's going to seem impossible for you, but it isn't. It's only impossible if you give yourself that verbiage. You have to identify what your needs are that you can provide for yourself. Right? Now, let me, I'm going to repeat that. What are your needs that you can provide for yourself? Because see, what you're holding on to, you're looking for other people to fill these voids, other people to not make you feel like you're, you know, not abandoned or that you're loved. Guess what? No one can do that if you don't have self-love. And that's a fact. You'll become codependent in those relationships. Then you'll have a hard time distancing yourself from a relationship because they make you feel good about yourself. But why do we need them to make you feel good about yourself? Okay, yeah, you want people who can be the icing to your cake. Hell, don't give them the recipe for the entire cake and then go, I don't know how to make this cake. I need you. We're not doing that. And you got to be clear in that. And I will repeat this in just about every thing on a regular basis. When you are going through your healing process, you will, not might, not maybe, you will lose people and that's okay. Stop trying to hold on and open up a new house with old keys you cannot open up a new door with an old set of keys. Stop trying to do it. Okay, the unknown, I have a podcast on here. Go back a few episodes. I can't remember exactly which one, but it wasn't that long ago. On fear, mistake. I mean, uh, failure, mistakes, and the unknown. It's just go back and listen to that. Because it'll really help you understand that you need to be able to do that. Because the goal here is for you to have zero manipulation or agenda. Right? So, a lot of times when you have anxious, well, any of them, but especially anxious attachment styles, there's a level of manipulation and gaslighting that you carry. Not intentionally, not maliciously, but you do carry it. Pretty much in like all of the lower level ones, like all of the lower vibrational ones. Um, and again, it's not about being superior. It's just when you have a secure attachment, you just vibrate at a higher level. It doesn't mean good or bad. So I just want to don't think that I'm like putting it down because I'm not because um, I lived there for a while. So 
it's but what and you can feel when you're vibrating low when you're vibrating low you're irritable you're all of those things and I'll do a whole podcast on vibrations and how you can raise your vibrations and it will get a little woo woo because that's my jam okay but you have zero manipulation or agenda so if you're kind to someone you do so with zero expectations in return if not it becomes transactional you don't want a transactional relationship that I do this so you have to do that now, if it doesn't align with you and you're like, wow, they are really not in my like vibe. They, they are, they're vibrating lower than me or, or higher than me or whatever. And it just, it's not my jam. Good. You don't have to rock with them. But you don't have to understand why are they not your jam? Why are they vibrating lower or higher? Why are they doing the, stop. That's a waste of your energy. Okay, so you got to focus on you because all of the judgment that you're putting on other people and why do they do this and what's wrong with them? Check yourself in the mirror. You have your own stuff to deal with. You are wasting your energy trying to figure out, in this case, why an avoidant can't give you what you need as an anxious attachment. You will beat your head up against the wall. It's never going to be the way that you want it to be until it is addressed either by you or by both of you to do your own healing. You can't do the healing for the both of you. That's the acceptability of that. And that's the huge part of it. Right? And you definitely want to do the journals. You have to be able to journal your stuff. I can't say this loud enough. It is unfortunate that your trauma has happened to you. It is unfortunate that maybe your caregivers did not provide for you the way that, they, that, the way that you would have liked for them to. You're right. That is a real thing and a real feeling. Yes, it is. However, okay, however, you don't get to surf on that for the rest of your life. Because if you do, it's not going to change. If you live in the victim of circumstance, you will remain there. Nothing positive can come out of that. You never look at the glass as half full. You're always looking at it from a negative perspective because maybe you had a whole bunch of negative people around you. You can't do that. So if you really want to work through this, A, you could call me, you can book a session with me, you can book a session with somebody, somebody. But don't try to do this by yourself. Number one. Number two, understand that you want self-tolerance. You want to be neutral. You want to understand that it's an all collective. No one is better nor worse than another human being. Everyone deserves to be valued by themselves and really by other people. I mean, you can value somebody and not like mess with them. You know what I mean? But you have to get into self-tolerance. You know, I'm pretty sure you feel this way. And if you haven't, congratulations, because I sure have. Where sometimes, especially when I was going through those attachment styles, I was irritated with my damn self. Like, I didn't need anybody else to be irrit- irritated with you. I, with me, I was irritated with myself. The presence and the company of me, I was irritated by that. So I knew if I was irritated with that, holy hell, everybody else, I, I must be a complete nightmare. And I own it. And I wear that like a crown because I wouldn't have never made the secure attachment had I hadn't understood it and gone through it and been vulnerable and be open to healing it. And you know, see, that's the whole thing. And I'm always going to come back to that. You can't blame other people, including yourself, by the way, right? You don't get to blame others, but you don't get to blame yourself. Right? And, And that's the thing. Like, you have to understand that you have, there's attachments, you, you know, these attachment issues are solvable. They really are. Make a note on your triggers. Make a note on your triggers. Don't avoid them. Everybody wants to avoid a trigger. Don't avoid a trigger. I mean, don't do this by yourself. If you're working with me, we're not going to avoid a trigger. We're going to face it head on. We're going to walk through the fire. But you need to identify it. And then tell yourself, hey, I'm safe. I'm here. But don't blame other people. Right? You can state your needs. State your needs in your own journal. State your needs with other people. If they can't meet them, they can't meet them vice versa. You don't change yourself for another human being. If you find yourself being defensive and reactive and not responsive, that's a good place to journal. Don't judge yourself. Place a neutral. Place a neutral. But if you have the awareness, all of the awareness that you seem to put on other people and all of the awareness that you feel that they're doing things wrong and that they need to do different and you sure have that, you don't have that down. I mean, you have that down pat. Well, let's turn that around. Let's put the mirror up in our face. If you want to do the work, you will soar. You will take your pain and turn it into power. 
But you cannot do that if you are absolutely resistant, and you will be resistant, but I mean hardcore resistant that it's everybody else, that everybody else owes you something. They don't. You need to understand that. And when you do, your feelings are valid to you in that moment. They're still perceptions. They will change. Facts don't change. Feelings do. And you have to understand that just because you carry that feeling, and let's say you're an anxious attachment person, notice I keep going there because I was very familiar with that one. It was like when I was going through, um, you know, just setting up my little notes and stuff for you guys, I was like, oh my God, this is like, I could, I could write 74 books on an anxious attachment. But that fear of abandonment doesn't mean that the, your partner has to call you 343 times a day to remind you how much they love you. That's clingy. That's a stage five clinger. And nobody wants to deal with that. Okay, so especially, could you imagine, and I've been in this situation where I've had anxious attachment friends, the j just girlfriends, not like anything like serious, just friends. And oh, when I was going through anxious attachment and they were going through anxious attachment, oh my God, what a nightmare. What a nightmare that was. We didn't trust anything. We thought everybody was going to leave us. Oh my God, it was a nightmare. Seriously. So check your relationships and keep in mind, it's not your job to change their styles and their theories, and their lives. Stop doing it. Stop doing it. Focus on you. And when you do that, that's how you start getting that self-esteem and self-confidence that you keep asking me about. And I'm so excited for you to have it. I am here for it 100% all the way. You fall, I'll pick you up. Your crown falls off, I'll put it on your head. You know, you skin your knees, hey, don't worry about it. Let me put an ace bandage on it, or, you know, a little bandage on it as long as you're doing the work. Where, where me and so many other people struggle is, I'm not going to do it for you. I'm not going to chase you to make you feel better. I'm not going to chase you to beg you to do your homework. I'm not going to say, oh my God, I'm calling you. Did you do your journals? That's not my job. That's not my job because I'm in a secure attachment. I am here for whoever wants it. The resources are here for you. My services are here for you. But I'm not going to do it and then chase after you to feel better. That's your job to do. I've already done that work. And trust me, woo wee, that was a journey. And yes, a very isolating one. Going through that lonely phase of being alone helped me so much to know who I was. So you have to allow yourself to face your fears or you will remain the same. So that's my wrap on attachment styles. And yeah, we're going to pick this up and go into um, another example of an exercise over there in Patreon for this. But I want you guys to know, listen, hey, this goes right over to my YouTube, by the way, let me know underneath. So go over to my YouTube, the positivity experience, this automatically funnels over there. And once you listen to it, let me know what you found about your attachment and what your what your resources and plans are to change them. Because you don't get to say, this is just how I am. That is never going to fly. Um, so you got this. Trust me. If Believe you me. If I, who thought that this was ingrained in my DNA, can go through this, you can soar. And don't you worry about it. You can get right on my back. I got you. And I love you. Check it out.